We're continuing our exploration of what Lacan has to say about dreams, the analysis of dreams, and more particularly what Lacan has to say about Freud's famous Irma dream and the commentary that Lacan offers in Seminar 2. One of our questions for this mini lecture is the question of where is the other in the dream? How do I get to this question? Well, let's do a little bit of a recap and we're going to draw on a quote from Owen Hewitson, um, who is the, I suppose you could say the editor or the person who runs Lacon Online. If you go to Lacon Online, you'll find a very nice article. Maybe there's two, in fact, exactly on these sections from Seminar 2, where Lacon is engaging with, uh, with the Irma dream. So this is what um, Hewitson has to say. And of course, the context for that is he's speaking of Lacon's critique of Eric Erickson's approach to the dream. And here's the quote from Hewitson. He says, if we're looking to see the difference, we'll see that there's a difference between the ego and the subject in looking at the dream. In other words, that Lacan's approach is not simply to find an ego's wish in a dream, but is rather to look for something beyond the ego, the subject, and also not merely looking for a wish, but looking for something far more destabilizing than a wish, namely desire. So back to Hewitson. Once we have a sense of the difference between the ego and the subject in looking at dreams, then we should be, here's the quote, wary of expecting the dream or any interpretation of the dream to tell us something about the intentions of Freud's ego. That's not what it's about. Desire for Lacan, back to Hewitson quote, is not located at the level of the ego, but at the level of the big symbolic other. Okay? Just to reiterate, desire for Lacan is not located at the level of the ego, but at the level of the big symbolic other. So for Lacan, we cannot take the dream as an indication of Freud's egoic state. So we made this point, but it's worth stressing. We're not looking for ego wishes, ego intentions. We're looking for desire, something far more radically destabilizing than merely wishes. And we're looking for something beyond the ego, namely the subject. That we've said before, but what Hewitson's quote usefully draws us to, draws our attention to, is looking at the level of the other. So what is the big other? How does the big other appear in the dream? Or differently put, um, who is the dream addressed to? And in that sense, where might we locate the big other as uh, the addressee of the dream? So it's an interesting question. It's one we'll take up. Okay, so we know that in the in the seminar two description Lacan is going to often and in a variety of ways highlight something that we might call uh, the decomposition of the ego it's not about centering the ego in in the dream you know which you could say is what Erickson is trying to do by finding different moments or different stages or d different developmental eras of an ego in Lacan's dream Lacan's approach entirely different. He repeatedly highlights the decomposition or the destructuration of the dreamer's ego. Hence my point here about imaginary destructuration. This is what Lacan seems to find most interesting. And presumably one of the reasons that he is most interested in, 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 in tracking this, in, in trying to capture something about the dream when we do have this rather anxiety provoking moment or moments of imaginary destructuration is that that will take us closer to the subject. The more the ego uh, or egoic formations are decomposed, pulled apart, the closer we'll get to something of the dimension of the subject. Now, let's immediately qualify that because he will say there's moments of decomposition or destructuration of the dream as ego, but Lacan will then also stress at these moments, we are at the point of the joint, he says, and here's a direct quote of the emergence of the dimension of the symbolic in relationship to the imaginary. OK, so just to highlight that the emergence of the dimension of the symbolic in relation to the imaginary. In other words, although we're having or we're experiencing something of a kind of destructuration of the imaginary egoic dimensions of the dream and the subject tense is coming to the fore. And although you could describe that when this uh, destructuration, this decomposition happens as a kind of emergence of the real relative to the, the fundamental presence and cohesion of an imaginary dimension, that is also to be taken in tandem with an understanding of where the symbolic is operating in the dream. 
So this is kind of what I'm going to be arguing throughout this mini lecture, is that although we find in many introductory um, texts on, on Lacan, we find the example of Freud looking into Irma's mouth and seeing this object of uh, anxiety par excellence, we'll give the quotes later, this emergence of the real, so on and so forth. We often find this as a kind of exemplifying instantiation of Lacan's use of the concept of the real. So much so that we get so focused on the concept of the real and, and, and the kind of decomposition of imaginary constituents that we forget that it's always necessarily accompanied by the symbolic. So two points to make here. One is to remind us that we've already seen in an earlier section of uh, Lacan's engagement with Irma's dream, these two dimensions, IS and SI. IS, the imagining of the symbol, or we could say the imaginarization of the signifier. And the imaginarization of the signifier, you will recall, is, is there in the formation of dreams in the first place. Dreams essentially seem to do this imaginarization of words, imaginarization of signifiers, of symbols. Hence, we have an IS, but we also, he says, Lacan says, need to bear in mind this, as it were, opposite trajectory of symbolizing the image, or as we might put it in, in, in more later Lacanian terms, signifier rising. Sorry for the bad word. Signifierizing doesn't really sound like an existing word. Symbolizing or signifierizing the image or the imaginary. So he really gives us these two trajectories, an IS trajectory and an SI. But to counter the problem I've just highlighted, that we get a little bit carried away and overly enthusiastic about the emergence of the real, I'm suggesting we borrow and make reference to this later schema from seminar uh, 20, which I've kind of just given the very bare bones, basic rendition of it. Lacan doesn't say an awful lot about it in Seminar 20, but what seems to me so useful about it is that even though this is 18 years later than Seminar 2, we still have an IS axis here or trajectory, um, and we've also got the real. But what's so useful here is we could spend a lot of time thinking about imaginary and real, but it always keeps in place the symbolic in relationship to real and imaginary. So if we were just thinking IS and SI here, maybe we'd not foreground, importantly enough, the dimension of the real. And if we were just thinking about the imaginary in its relationship to the real, we may not foreground strongly enough the dimension of the symbolic. Hence, this is why I think we should keep this in mind. Okay, so just before we um, move forward and see how this schema might help us situate certain facets of the dream, it's an interesting exercise and, and I think an instructive one, we could also just return to something I've noted before, the prevalence of death in dreams. It's a comment that Bruce Fink makes in, in his commentary on uh, Seminar 6. And what starts to become apparent here is that this uh, fascination that Lacan has with the kind of imaginary destructuration seems one way of, of approaching this idea of the, the, the presence of the motif of death. In dreams. Maybe this is what's most crucial, that we see something about the ego being decomposed. And it seems very interesting that Lacan does this characteristic move, which is a, is a, is a nice sort of interpretive engagement move that he does a lot of, you will notice, of course, he's done this all over the place, a moment, an earlier moment in Freud's work with a later moment in Freud's work. And one of the comparisons he, set, he draws here is to say that there's something similar going on in Freud's dream of Irma, Irma's injection, to another famous dream, maybe one of the most other famous dreams in psychoanalysis in the history, certainly of the cases that Freud presents, and that of course is the Wolfman's dream. Both of these give us something like the emergence of the Medusa head. What does he mean by this? Well, let's have a look and see what he has to say about this. And I suppose what I'm trying to highlight here is that there seem to be certain kinds of dreams Maybe they emerge at a certain period of a treatment that have a very, uh, that have a somewhat disproportionate impact. And these dreams seem to involve something of the real emerging in a very dramatic way, perhaps, or very forceful way. And they also seem to confront the subject with something that takes them beyond the parameters, the stabilizing parameters of their ego. So just a couple of lines, we're shooting ahead here to page 175, we'll go back. He says, uh, let's begin again talking about the specimen dream of Irma's injection. The dream's quest, quest leads to a gap to this open mouth at the back of which Freud sees this terrifying composite image, which we compare to the revelation of the Medusa's head. So the revelation of the Medusa's head 
which interestingly starts to sound <clears throat> a little bit like it's anticipating the notion of thus being the thing to come. Let's keep that in parentheses. Uh, seems to be a nice way of evoking something of the, the real emerging, the real kind of swallowing up uh, the imaginary. And uh, we can already start to think maybe this side of the schema is a little bit uh, interesting. I mean, maybe this is one place we could, we could locate a facet of the dream in terms of that schema. Um, Lacan continues, the dream is not unique in this respect, he says, Freud's dream. Those who participated in my seminars the year before, they were held, okay, you know, the seminar before, seminar one, may recall that the singular character of the wolfman's dream, of which it could be said that it has, over the whole of the analysis of this case, a function ana uh, analogous to the acme which we discern in the dream of Omer's injection. So a very interesting comparison between the famous wolfman's dream, the dream of the wolves in the tree which are staring, which are gazing at him. This has a dramatic effect, maybe a destructuring effect, which is akin in some respects to the dream that Lacan is focusing on, Freud's dream. Um, let's have a look. Uh, the dream appears, he says, reactivated by specific occasion in the life of the subject. So he's making a comparison. He says, in certain dreams, we find there's something like a unique and decisive revelation of the subject. That's worthwhile repeating, I think. In certain dreams, that's my part, there's something like a unique and decisive revelation of the subject in which an indefinite something that is unsayable is concentrated, in which the subject is lost for a moment, blown up. Again, I think that this is now on page 176 is worth reiterating. There is something like a unique and decisive revelation of the subject, an indefinite something that is unsayable and concentrated in which the subject is lost for a moment. The subject decomposes, fades away, dissociates into its various egos. The subject decomposes, fades away, and dissociates into its various egos. So, so just to say that I think this is crucial, the impact of certain of these dreams, whether it's this dream of seeing the wolfman seeing uh, the wolves in the tree, uh, Freud's dream, it's one that bears this impact of decomposition, fading away, dissociating into various egos. But what is particularly interesting about that is, yes, we are having these highly impactful dreams where there is a dissociation fading away, but note the, the clause at the end, dissociates into its various egos. So on the one hand, it sounds like the ego is being reduced. It's being almost like it's a call out to the later notion of subjective destitution. Subjective destitution, of course, can be understood, seminar seven, the phrase appears, uh, can be understood in a variety of different ways. But one of the ideas about subjective destitution, one way that we could try and engage it, is that in subjective destitution, the subject is kind of cut off from its various imaginary uh, ties, from its various imaginary identifications which hold the ego in place as it is. It's kind of shorn of those intersubjective imaginary grounding points. So it sounds like there's a little kind of type of subjective destitution going on, but it's also apparent that it doesn't happen simply in a one-way direction. It's not just that the subject is swallowed up by the real because we have here a dissociation uh, a decomposition dissociates into its various egos. So there's a sense in which maybe it's not just a one, one way traffic here, dissociates back into egos. I'll go back in a little while to say something about that. But just to highlight this dimension of the dream, this decomposition aspect of the dream, Lacan goes on to say, um, such privileged experiences, and of course he's now also talking in this section of seminar two about uh, beyond intersubjectivity. These privileged experiences, privileged experiences of the real, of the incursion of something real, occur beyond the imaginary dimension of intersubjectivity. On page 177, he gives us this quote, rather than a consolidation of the ego via various imaginary others, sorry, that's me, not Lacan. Rather than a consolidation of the ego via various imaginary others, we have an essential tearing apart of the subject and that's where the essential meaning, the liberating meaning of the dream begins. So just to foreground that very uh, crucial point, that there's almost an essential meaning here, or maybe it's the essential non-meaning, because the subject is, is, or the ego is being, as it were, torn apart, the liberating meaning of the dream. So another way of putting that is that it's often at these kind of quasi-near traumatic moments, 
of a dream where there's some essential meaning, some liberating meaning coming into play. Okay, so that will give us a sense of where we're heading from. Over here, I've said, let's have some caution regards a reduction to the real, or what I sometimes think about is this, this uh, tendency to do a kind of romanticization of the real. You know, we can sometimes, we know the phrase from Alenko Zupanchik about an ethics of the real, for example, and I've heard critiques of this, despite that this is an, you know, excellent scholarly engagement. But the idea is sometimes if we foreground, sorry for the repetition, foreground the real as the most kind of dramatic uh, attention grabbing facet of uh, a Lucanian vocabulary, we, we neglect something of the symbolic and imaginary dimension. So we're going to try and keep that in mind. So here's our schema. Um, there's not a huge amount of excellent commentary on this. Slava Zizek has obviously offered some nice moments, um, but I think what I've offered here is reasonably self-explanatory. We've got these three trajectories, but just to give a one note here, there is in the middle of this schema a kind of well of, of jouissance. And um, this is something that we can ask ourselves, how does this, this feature in the dream? And indeed, that's what we want to ask. How various facets of the dream would they be located here? So in order to start that type of analysis, thinking about what moments in the dream, what key facets of the dream could be located on uh, each of these uh, points, um, we could do a little bit of historical work. And in fact, Lacan shows us the way. He says, if you spend enough time and you look at, uh, so this is the a collection of letters between uh, Freud and Wilhelm Fleiss. He says, you can see what Freud is talking about as he's struggling to come up with this theory of dreams. And he gives us a sense of the, the, the difficulties, the struggles that Freud had at this period, at this parent period. So this is what Lacan has to say. In letter 138 to Fleece, Freud complains of his research into dreams, and he says the following. The big problems are still unsettled. It is an intellectual hell, layer upon layer of it, with everything fitfully gleaming and pulsating, and the outline of Lucifer, a more, coming into sight at the darkest center. I mean, if you ever had to question whether Freud was a, a descriptive or effective writer, I mean, I think that, that little autobiographical note uh, illustrates something of, of that. Now, if we've got this well of jouissance, this kind of overbearing um, kind of dimension of anxiety, which each of these trajectories, each of these axes is in a sense a kind of escape from, you could say, well, maybe the entirety of the dream is, is or the context of that Freud is struggling with might suggest that the emergence of the dream could be positioned here at this kind of well, this uh, sinkhole of jouissance. And again, I already noted earlier on that the Medusa head description sounds a bit like something of a precursor to the notion of dust ding. This uh, well of jouissance here in the middle of this diagram may also give us this abyss of enjoyment, I think is one phrase that Slavoj Žižek uses to describe it. And again, maybe even more so in this instance, this abyss of enjoyment, this well of jouissance sounds a little bit like the dimension of dust ding that will emerge in seminar um, seven. But let's see what Lacan has to say about this description that Freud has offered of the big problems everything is unsettled, Lucifer, uh, the fitfully gleaming and pulsating. I mean, he, he's giving us almost like a, a, a depiction of a kind of intellectual hell. So what does Lacan say? He says, what Freud gives us is an image of waves, of oscillations, as if the entire world were animated by a disquieting imaginary pulsation. Golly, you've got to say Freud can write, Lacan can write or speak too. Image of waves, oscillation, a world animated by disquieting imaginary pulsations. Lacan continues, and this is to be found on 162 of, of Seminar 2. It is an image of fire in which appears the silhouette of Lucifer, who seems to embody the anxiety-ridden dimension of Freud's experience. He continues, Freud's discovery of the unconscious occurring then as it was, was putting into question the very foundation of the world. Direct quote, the dream Freud had is, is a dream integrated into the progress of his discovery. That's a nice moment. The dream Freud had is as a dream integrated into the progress of his discovery. 
Lacan continues, we cannot separate off from the interpretation the fact that Freud makes of the dream our first step toward the key to the dream. It is us that Freud is addressing when making this interpretation. It is us that Freud is addressing when making this interpretation. So you'll remember towards the beginning of this mini lecture, I asked where is the other of the dream? And one potential answer to that question is that Freud is addressing a future audience in how he arranges, speaks of, and portrays the dream. In a sense, in a very real sense, even as we're watching or participating in this video, you could say that we are at some strange level the addressees of Freud's dream, or maybe if not his dream, of his treatment and interpretation of the dream, which is after all precisely the specimen dream of psychoanalysis. So there's an interesting kind of message of history that is apparent here. And I won't belabor the point too much, but towards the beginning of the four fundamental concepts of psychoanalysis, in other words, Seminar 11, there is also a moment when Lacan wants to highlight the dimension of Freud's desire. And he wants to emphasize the idea that to be an analyst, to take seriously the, the task, the vocation, the desire to be an analyst, to do that means at some level one inherits a facet of Freud's desire, the desire for the practice of psychoanalysis. So here we have two different moments where we are located within, uh, as an in, inheritees, as descendants of Freud's desire. Back though to this idea of what should we do with this historical context of Freud's intellectual struggle and where we should potentially locate this. Just to stress also, that's a, a key point, the way that Lacan is engaging with the dream is not like so many of his um, contemporaries and those who've tried to do rival or additional auxiliary interpretations of Freud's dream or of Freud's interpretation of the dream. Lacan wants to take it as a whole, both the way Freud uses, explores, portrays, writes about the dream and the dream itself and the project of psychoanalysis. Those things are all part of how he wants to engage the dream. So if we were to try and locate this observation, Freud's intellectual struggle at the time of the dream, if we were to try and locate this observation of Lacan's, uh, where would it be? Now I've suggested we could think about putting it in here. Now, of course, the juxtaposition of how Zizek describes this facet of the schema and how Freud describes his own intellectual struggle is very suggestive. For Zizek, this lake of jouissance here is considered the abyss of traumatic excessive enjoyment, okay? An abyss of traumatic excessive enjoyment. And Lacan speaks about the anxiety-ridden dimension of Freud's experience. Sounds like they might overlap. We could say then that this is where, if we were to use the Seminar 220 schema as a way of plotting facets of Freud's dream, that this is one place where we could put that uh, autobiographical sketch that, that Freud has given us. It may seem that that's a good place. I think that would be a mistake, however, because if we listen carefully to how Lacan characterizes that, he says, he keeps on emphasizing the image dimension. He says, this is an image of waves, okay? Talking about Freud's depiction of his intellectual struggle, the Lucifer dimension of everything is, is up in the air. Lacan reiterates that it's an image of waves, an image of fire, and he also, right there on the page, characterizes it as occupied by imaginary pulsations. And of course, we have then the figure of Lucifer, who sounds like an attempt at imaginarizing the real, perhaps with some symbolic elements. So maybe then that facet of the dream might be more adequately accommodated somewhere on this axis, real to imaginary. So the whole figure of Lucifer might be seen as, a, as an interesting imaginarization effect, right? Something's experienced as, a, as an awful real, as a kind of hell, as a kind of dissolution. But to suddenly give that experience a figure, to give it an embodied identity of a Lucifer, sounds like a kind of uh, exemplary instance of a kind of imaginarization of the real. So maybe that facet of the dream, Freud's autobiographical account, could be located there, not so much over there. We could then situate this experience along the trajectory linking real to imaginary. So we will, I think, pause 
very shortly and carry on in our next lecture. But maybe just to highlight one more thing, I keep on suggesting that these are trajectories. And of course, that's one way of reading the schema. But you could also say that these are kind of impossibilities, non-relations, uh, difficulties, impossibilities. But nevertheless, what we'll continue with in our, in our next mini lecture is to, to think about where else we might situate facets of the dream there. And what we'll also try and focus on quite strongly is how to think about the, the dimension of desire in the dream. And not just only the dimension of desire, but how the dream itself might be a kind of mode of, of ethics. So we'll stop with that.